this town. Uh, a long time ago, in 1981, when I came here, first time I ever came here to play music, was I was in this band Black Flag, and I came here, and we were so psyched. We're like, wow, our first European tour. We're going to be in England. We're going to rock. And we were so excited, and we got here, and our first show was with the Damned at the Lyceum. And I, I was like the biggest Damned fan in the world. What great records those, those guys made, you know? And I, I remember seeing, seeing them in the summer of 1979, where I come from, Washington, D.C., and they just destroyed the place. They were amazing. And they were just brilliant, and they're really cool guys. And so our first gig is going to be with the damned. I am so psyched. I'm beside myself with psyched-dom. And um, <laughs> we're hanging out backstage. I meet Captain Sensible. I'm like, whoa, I just met Captain Sensible. I just met Dave Vaney, and they're really cool guys. And I'm like 20. I'm like, whoa, man, rock and roll. <laughs> you know, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. And, you know, it's going to be our first gig in front of the UK audience. And we go barreling down the stairs to go play at the Lyceum. And it's like, I don't know, 50. Whatever the Lyceum holds, like just hardcore damned fans. And they do not want to deal with this opening band, any opening band. They're like, they're, they want to see one band, the damned. And everything else in front of them is this thing that's in the way. And so here we come doing our thing. And between the songs, it was incredible. You could hear hair growing on faces. <laughs> You could hear leather jackets being zipped up, mohawks being tweaked, you know, you know, piercings being done. I mean, no one cared. We got not even a negative response. We got no response. Every once in a while, some odd globule of phlegm would fly from the crowd. Like, oh, well, yeah, right. <laughs> And we did all these other shows, and these kids would come up and spit on us, and the skinheads wanted to beat us up, and all this crazy shit happened. It's like, no one likes us. And we did all these shows with the Exploited. They have all these skinhead guys who follow the Exploited, and they hate our guts, you know? And they're like, sing, hiling us. And what am I supposed to do in the face of that? Oh, hello, hello. Yes, uh, oh, yes, you hate black people. Very good. Oh, yes, Pakistanis out of your country. Yes, I understand that. <laughs> I was like, man, fuck you guys. They're like, Who? you don't like us? I'm like, no, like, Who? Who? like folding chairs, pint mugs. <laughs> so the first time we were here really sucked. And um, <laughs> so we came back like, you know, in 83 and we're like, oh, don't hurt us, don't hurt us. And like people were a little nicer, but there's still like the odd globule of saliva flying. And then in 84, we came back like, Fuck all y'all. And we did every single show in England. We played the ZZ Top Eliminator album in a loop before we'd go on stage. And like punkers are just bumming out on us, you know? Like, what the fuck are you doing? We're like, fuck you, ZZ Top rules, you pussy. Get out of my club. <laughs> so years went by and England started becoming a cooler place and I got my own band and people started getting nicer and nicer and nicer. And now I come here and I have a really good time. But I do remember back in the days when I, I just ripped on England. I'm like, so I go, so what do you think of England? Fuck, fuck them, fuck. Shitty food, bad place to stay. People are mean, they throw chairs, they throw pint mugs, they zig highly, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. <laughs> you know, but it, well, it would be like, you know, how you would react if you went into some place with the best intentions and everyone, you know, started throwing stuff at you. You'd be like, <laughs> you know, you'd be like scorned and buked and you'd be, you'd be pissed off at that rejection. It made me wonder what people in bands think when they get this following of people who either they can't stand or are terrified of. <laughs> like, what if you were like Susie Sue, which was like the diva for goth people, right? She goes out every night and plays, and what does she see in front of her? A bunch of overweight, pasty-faced people who dress in nine layers of flat black clothing, winter, summer, spring, fall. <laughs> Their hair is fucked up. They're, they're trying to look deader than they have ever been. You know, they're, they're trying to look more post-mortem, you know. 
And I wonder if she would go out there to see and go, fucking hell, who are all these deadbeats who like me? Susie, we love you. Why? Fuck you. Get a haircut. Put some color in your cheeks. Come on, let's get laid. I, or poor old Morrissey. You know, he goes out there singing his songs. And what does he get? What does he get? He gets like crying 15-year-old boys. Oh, November spawn the monster. I wonder if you ever looked at one. Oh, fucking hell, what am I gonna do? <laughs> that would make me, you know, wanna buy a Bon Jovi record, eat some red meat, and fuck in the streets, you know? But Remember when you were like eight years old and you did something really stupid, like you put your hand in the fire and you, it burned the shit out of you and you never, ever, ever did it again. You go, put your hand on fire, it fucking hurts, I'll never do it again. You learned, right? I never did. I go, okay, ow, fuck. You think you're bad, huh? <laughs> no, I'm stronger than fire. <laughs> no, I'm not. Oh, God. <laughs> All right. I was just wasn't prepared. I was, you know, didn't have enough of my pain threshold accentuated. Oh, and finally, you know, I have to find out the fact that if you put your hand in the fire, it will get burned. And so it takes me a while to learn the lesson. And I finally learned this lesson last year after many years of like getting the lesson offered to me but not having the guts to take in the information. And the lesson I learned is that I am 10% as cool as I ever thought I was. The thing that made me learn it was, I did this wild movie last year with um, Kelly McGillis and Billy Zane where I had to be a psychotic redneck named Monroe. I am the subliterate rapist guy. I'm the killer, rapist, deceitful, horrible Monroe. And so we're doing this movie, I'm working really hard, it's like 100 degrees and there's like mosquitoes and alligators and rattlesnakes and all kinds of shit in the swamp. And so I'm acting away, doing all this stuff, and the director comes up to me one day and he goes, okay, I want to talk to you about your nude scene. I went, what? <laughs> he goes, you have a nude scene. You've read the script. I go, I've read the script three times. And he goes, well, you've got a nude scene. I go, where? He goes, the time when you're in that bathtub in front of the house. You know, it's me and Billy, a young actor named Johnny Galicki, who's an intensely talented young man. And the three of us to get in these iron bathtubs and scrub all the alligator shit off us from running around in the swamps. And I said, uh, you're going to see me from the waist up. Who cares? And he goes, no, 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 no. We'll see Billy and Johnny from the waist up. We'll see all of you. I'm like, why? He said, because you have to get out of the tub, put your pants on, and go take out the blind mule cart driver who's coming up. See, there's a guy, a blind mule you know, driving guy, and he comes up, and I'm going to kill him and take the mule cart, and we're going to go to freedom on the mule cart over the county line or whatever. So I said, okay, so what do I do? He goes, you're going to get out of the bathtub, camera's going to basically see the gear, and then see your ass, and then you're going to put the pants on that are hanging from a nail over here on a tree, put them on and exit that way. And uh, I just want to know now, since you're an actor, it is your right to have a body double. I go, body double? He goes, yeah. Uh, we'll find a guy, we'll go to some, you know, penitentiary or <laughs> some farm and find something that looks like you and he'll do the nude part and we'll cut to you putting the pants on and so you won't have to be naked. And that's where the my macho bullshit comes into play. I'm like, oh, you think I can't be naked in a movie? He's like, no, 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 I, look, Henry, actors do it all the time. Like, no, I don't give a fuck about being naked. I can be naked right now. I'll walk down the street in New York at noon naked. You think I can? He's like, well, look. I go, I'll do it. You don't get a body double. I'll do it naked right now. He goes, Henry, thank you. I don't have the time to cast a body double. I don't have the budget. You are saving my ass. Thank you. I'm like, hey, man, anything for the production. And besides, I don't give a fuck about being naked. I'm the man. Hey, uh, uh, you know, Darwinian, Nietzschean, proclivity to survive. You know, natural selection. More women will see me and select me. <laughs> Naturally. So anyway. Right. Yeah, right. And so I go into makeup and hair, and usually those t the makeup and hair women like tease me mercilessly. I, I come in, they put on a Hootie and the Blowfish CD on the boom box. They go, what do you think of this music? I'm like, all right, very funny, very funny. And on this day, they're like, good morning, Henry. I'm like, good morning. Please have a seat. I'm like, did I piss you girls off? I'm like, no, why are you asking? I said, because you're being really serious. We usually fuck with each other and wake each other up in the morning. Why are you being all professional now? They said, well, uh, today is your um, nude scene, and we figured you would like some time to collect yourself before you had to be naked. And they're so intense about it, I got all intense. I'm like, oh, 
Uh, the, the nude scene, yeah. Oh, 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 and you know they're putting the makeup on. I'm like, oh, nude scene, nude scene. How can I get all all worked up about it? We have all these scenes to do before we get to the nude scene. We have hours to go, and every scene before the nude scene, I'm like, 90 percent, and 10 percent. I don't want to be naked. So. <laughs> It took a lot of concentration to get to the, you know, get through the, the morning work. And all of a sudden, we're in front of the house, and there's these iron wash tubs. And Billy and Johnny are standing there in surf trunks, smoking cigarettes. And I'm standing there in my underwear, because I have to get naked, and they don't. And they're like, hey, it sucks to be you. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not scared. And to cover up my fear, I have taken my pants I have my, the underwear on. I have the underwear all the way up as high as I can get them. And see, the package has gone to the left here. You're right, my left. So I've got my pants way up here, and I'm standing there naked except for my underwear. And like the, you know, the underwear is way up here. And I'm thinking, I am like, I must be hilarious, you know, because when you have your pants up at this altitude, you can say anything, and it's funny. Like, I can hit on any woman in this building and not offend. You know, I can walk up, hey baby. <laughs> what do you think of the spoken word so far, huh? <laughs> and we're usually, you go like, fuck off! You know, you, you go like, all right, very funny. Alternatively, I can go up to any guy and go like, come on. <laughs> Fucking, you know, come on. And you go like, get out of here. You, you can't take me seriously. I mean, look at this, <laughs> right? Uh, so I'm standing there going like, and I'm standing there looking at all the cast and crew going, who wants to fight me? <laughs> and the wardrobe woman comes up with a towel and she holds it out. And I'm like 37 at the time. You know, I'm a big boy now. I've been naked in front of women before. <laughs> at least, you know, and so mom counts, right? Uh, <laughs> and so it shouldn't be a big deal to get naked in front of a woman who doesn't care whether I'm naked, purple, or on fire. I mean, she could give a fuck. You know, she's holding the towel, looking away from me like, fucking actors, you know. I'm like, okay, okay, here I go. No looking. She's like, oh, I wouldn't think of it. You know, like, like she cares. I'm like, <laughs> okay, here. And she's like, she's like, oh God. I boom, hop into the tub. And so in the scene, I have to, you know, when the director says action, I have this dialogue with Billy who's in the tub over there. And then I get a second action. I have to get up and hear the mule cart coming around the bend, but we don't have the mule or the cart yet. So I have to put on my best, this way a mule driven cart comes face. Like, <laughs> get out of the tub, turn around, grab my pants, put them on and exit. And the director comes over, he goes, Henry, how you doing buddy? And I'm sitting there naked in this tub of water going, I I I'm okay. And he's like, hey, can you do this? I'm like, yeah, man, I can do it. I don't give a fuck about being naked. He goes, Henry, get this in one take and we got it and we'll go to lunch. So nail it and let's finish it. I said, you got it, you got it. He goes, okay. Be intense. You're gonna. You're about to kill a guy, right? I go, yeah, I can do it. I can do it. He's like, okay, good luck, buddy. You're gonna do just fine. I'm like, all right, man. He's got me all pumped up. And so, and take one, action. And I'm like, dialogue with Billy. And the director goes, action, Henry. And I go like, <laughs> and row the rapist, murderer, you know, penitentiary all his life gets out of the tub like. And I go bend backwards like this, hoping that my ass will somehow magically disappear. <laughs> Grab the pants off the nail and try and put a wet foot into a wet pant leg, like, so no one can see the package. It's the most unnatural clothes, you know, putting on ever. I'm like, and the heel of my foot digs into the wet pant leg and stops. So I'm like being wrestled to the ground by the pants. I'm like, <laughs> cut! I'm like, must get back to the tub. And I'm <laughs> crew people are looking at me, wanting to explode in laughter. <laughs> but they can't, because I'm the actor. I'm the delicate emotional instrument of the director. They've got to follow protocol. If the director doesn't laugh, they can't laugh. But they're all like, <laughs> director comes over, he wants to laugh. But he can't, because I'm the delicate, intellectual, emotional instrument. And if he laughs, he'll crush my safety zone, and I'll have to run back to my trailer and cry and cry. So he comes over and goes, okay, Henry, that was great. That was really great, okay? On this next take, I want you to do it a little differently. Um, I want you to get out of the tub, 
like you're going to put your pants on and kill someone. And make it look like you're going to get out of the tub and put your pants on and kill someone. And don't make it look like you're trying to carry a grape between your knees and then crush a walnut with your ass cheeks. Okay, on this take. So can you do that? I'm like, yeah, I can do it. He's like, okay. And like, you know, take two, you know, action, blah, blah, blah. Action, Henry. I'm like, and I get out. <laughs> Cut. Like, Henry, what are you doing? You're Monroe. You're a rapist. You're a psychopath. You don't go. Woo, 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 woo. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just kind of getting, getting into my thing. He goes, okay, okay, that's good. So just concentrate. You're Monroe. You're a murderer. I'm, like, I'm a murderer. I'm a murderer. I'm a murderer. I am Monroe. Let's do it. And I immediately lost the plot. I, I became so uncomfortable and self-conscious. The fact that I had to be naked in front of like 50 people at like one in the afternoon, I totally went over the top. I went, oh, murderous, you know, not caring about being naked. I'll show you not caring about being naked by like take five. I was like, and action, Henry. I get out of the tub. And the director goes, cut! And he comes over, what the hell was that? <laughs> and he's just so pissed off. He goes, what is that? I'm like, I, I don't know. I, I have no idea what I'm doing now. I look at, at, at all the crew guys. They're looking at me like, you disgust me. I wanted you to sign a book for my kid, but now I just want to kick your disgusting ass. And it took me an hour and a half to get this scene. You know, I kept coming out of the tub like, And finally, I got it right, and I was naked for like two hours, you know, one and a half hours, and it was excruciating. And I learned the lesson. I learned that, do I not give a fuck about being naked? Oh, I give a big one. <laughs> that, I'm, that I'm thoroughly, you know, you know, vulnerable to all that stuff. I'm thoroughly self-conscious, and I thought I was so past it, and so, you know, Mr. Tough Guy, and I found out that I wasn't. And those crew guys are relentless for the rest of the week. Hey, you gonna do any more nude scenes? I'm like, man, I, I hate you guys. I hate you guys. Like, that, when, that time when the breeze came by, and it hit you, and you shriveled up, that, to me, was the best take. <laughs> A while ago, I went to Thailand, and we have two days off, 48 hours off from the rock tour in Thailand. We are extremely excited. And so we come busting out of immigration. We've got our suitcases on wheels. We're like this roving, ambulatory, wheeled pack, like, oh, looking for a man who's holding a sign that says Rollins Band. Like, where's the man who bears the sign? The sign! <laughs> And there he is. He stands thus in the mist. Ah! And we run up to this guy. And there's a guy you know, with a plaque that says, Rollins Band. And we, go, ah! we get like an inch from the guy. You are the man. We are the band. We are Rollins Band. This is Team Thailand 1997. Let's do this. And the first thing the guy said was like, be quiet. We're like, damn. And you remember when you were 11, when someone, everyone was telling you to be quiet all the time. When I was 11, man, I was being told to shut up like every 20 seconds. So I was like, hey, 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 shut up. Ah, ah. You know, then I was put on the anti-hyper drugs. So I was like, nee, for the next 16 years. But those first five years were just awesome before they developed Ritalin and they just jacked me full of it. And I was like, mm, holding onto my desk for the long ride to puberty. But anyway. <laughs> but we... And so he goes, hello, my name is 74. <laughs> did, did he just say his name is 74? Yeah, I think so. Well, you talk to me, you talk to me, seems to like you. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, your name is 74? Yes, I'm 74. And he points to a badge on his jacket that says driver 74. I'm like, oh, oh that's your name? 74? Yes, you call me 74. Cool, cool, just cheer up. I'll call you anything you want, mellow out. 
And so we get in his van, and we're driving into Bangkok, and we're like, whoa, Bangkok, 1997, we are rock and roll. And he's like, look, be quiet. We're like, damn, he's like totally killing the vibe. And so he tells us that, you know, you, we can hire him for the equivalent of like $8 an hour, and he will drive us all over Thailand for the next two days. And so we meet him the next day, and we drive all over Bangkok, going to temples and all this stuff. And we see like the, re, uh, the reclining Buddha. He's like a block long. He's like this long Buddha sitting on his elbow, and you take a long lap around the reclining Buddha. I like Buddha because he's, he's smiling. He's mellow. He's not sending you to hell for masturbating. I thought he was cool. And and, you know, he's, he's all kicked back, like, hey, worship me, worship yourself, worship anything. Woo, I'm Buddha. It's going to be cool, babe. It's real cool, you know. So I like Buddha. I got a good vibe off him. And so by the end of the day, we're, you know, we're all like sunbaked because it's always like 98 degrees in, in Thailand. And so we're like, I'm dying, I'm dying. I want to go back to my room and read my Dostoevsky book and have my pithy thoughts, write in my journal, jerk off, go to sleep. And um, <laughs> keeping it real. Keeping it real, man. And so, yeah, listen to all these pathetic men. Yeah, man, I jerk off all the time too, man. You understand me, man. Yeah, meet a guy who's never had a dick in his hand, his or someone else's, and give you a dollar. Anyway, we've all been there, man. So anyway, uh, we're driving back towards the hotel, and one of the guys in the band said, um, we want to go to a Thai sex show. And I was like, oh yeah, they have those things in this town. And I went, ooh, ooh, I don't want to go. And um, one of the guys says, well, why not? I said, because it fucks with my Darwinian Nietzschean proclivities. You know, because I think <laughs> if you have to pay to see people naked, that means you're not a breeder, you're not a warrior, you're not a conquering, testosterone-driven, fucking killing machine, which I pride myself in being. And I could, so I could never, I could never go because in the jungle, in the jungle, you would be weeded out. You would be eaten by your own kind at the watering hole at sundown. You would not be in the next breeding pool, you know? You'd be a recessive trait. You'd be like a rock journalist. You would not, in, in, in a more brutal... And so I said, fellas, I'm going to take the moral high road. I don't need to see women doing weird things with themselves. I'm going to go back to my room. And one of the guys in the band said something that made a lot of sense. He goes, well, you know what? You know, go ahead and take the moral high road and feel really good about yourself. But guess what? We're in Thailand. Come to this stupid sex show with us, okay? And see this juvenile display with us. And it'll be a nice page in your journal. And it'll be a wonderful story for one of your spoken word shows. <laughs> and you know... Basically, he was just telling me, like, why don't you just cool out, relax a little, and have some stupid fun with your buddies in the band. And I love these guys, you know? I said, you know what? I'm with you. I'm going. And you go into a place that has a stage, like a square, with like a boxing ring, ropes around it, and everything, are, you know, is like tiered seating, like all on all four sides. Like a bo it looks like a boxing ring. And there's no room in this place except for like six spaces ringside. And so we go, you know, winding through like three or four hundred people, and we're sitting right at the stage. And I got my, like, my chin is right there. I mean, I am there. I got people behind me, a stage in front of me, strangers on this side of me, and the rest of the band on this side of me. I am hemmed in on all sides. I'm going nowhere. And so we're waiting, and tw for 20 minutes, nothing happens. I'm like, I'm sorry, just complaining. Like, this is very boring. I'm like, shh, be quiet. I'm like, I could be home reading. Be quiet. <laughs> boring, boring. Shut up, you're a killjoy. <laughs> I look across the ring, because I want to see who's coming to this show. You know, you always have to put everyone else down. I know I'm here because I'm just the cynical guy, and I'm above all this. Let's see the people who really bought into this joke. So you're looking around, and there's like couples, there's young people, and no one's there like, eh, I'm a dirty old man. There's like, yeah, we're coming to a fucking Thai sex show. What's going to happen? And I see these people across the ring, and they're like, And what am I going to do? Oh, uh, I'm not here. <laughs> I, just, I just went like... <laughs> what, what am I going to do? Hide? And so somewhere in the world, some, like, some tourist said, like, I saw Henry Rollins at a sex show. How did you see that? Oh, I was there too. Oh, there you go. <laughs> 
So finally the show starts and a man and a woman come on stage in underwear and they promptly take the underwear off and they're there naked in this ring. I'm like, N oh no, <laughs> they're not gonna, because you figure man, the woman, it's a sex show. No, he couldn't possibly earn, he did. <laughs> and the little foreplay ensues and bam, they go right to work. The woman is on her back and the guy's on top of her working away. I am right in his eye line. He's looking right at me, right through me, and he's like, mm, and I'm like. <laughs> There's like nowhere for me to go. I'm like, I'm not seeing this. And he's like looking at me like, how you doing? Three sets a night, five nights a week. Good work if you can get it. <laughs> And the girl is like a lot of women during sex. They're looking past the heaving head at the ceiling. <laughs> sex must be really boring for some women, just getting like, they're like Baghdad. They're just like, you know, incoming, just getting scudded. Boom, boom, boom. And then like the guy like puts on that horrible face. <laughs> You have this slobbering, snoring, drooling, useless thing on top of you. Like <laughs> going for like that power sleep. <laughs> and like, what do women do? Like, huh? one, two, three. <laughs> and the guy wakes up from his post-coital days. Like, <laughs> and he remembers his sensitivity training in, at university. He goes like, uh, uh, did, you, did you have an orgasm? Like he, like he gives a fuck. <laughs> and... And that's when women do one of the most marvelous lies that you women have ever concocted. You look at the guy and say, no, but that's the truthful part. It's okay, it felt nice. <laughs> and I don't believe you, okay? I don't believe that that's okay with you. I just do not believe it. Because I know how men would be if they didn't get to come every single time they had sex. You know, they'd be like, huh, huh, huh? Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> they wouldn't go, oh, don't worry. It felt nice. <laughs> they get up. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> Staggering out into the street naked with this hard on, like killing cars, ripping men's heads off, finding a large rock to beat themselves into unconsciousness. You know, man found on the street, you know, arcing hard on, unconscious, <laughs> bleeding from mouth and nose. I think a lot of male violence is, it's very vain. You know, like when they whoop somebody's ass, they want an audience. They want to like punch this guy just right. They wish it was a three camera shoot directed by Tarantino, you know? It's like, I'm, I'm kicking your ass, check me out. Like, <laughs> oh, you wait, okay, yeah. Is the camera on? Cool. How's it? Yeah, cool. You know, and, and usually it's like that, or it's the prelude to intense, like, an everlasting friendship between two guys. Boom, 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 boom. Fuck you, fuck you. I love you, man. <laughs> and they go back in right up to that pub and buy each other drinks until they collapse in each other's arms, and hopefully they will get an apartment together, and <laughs> we'll see them later. Uh, but women, on the other hand, their violence is, it's just never, it's just never for show. It's like they mean it. And it's the kind of violence that you respect and fear, and you never doubt it. Two women get into it, one of those chicks is gonna come home with a scalp, you know, a dripping scalp. You get into your girl's car, some swinging from the rear view, what is that? Some chick's ovaries, man. Cause for women, it is real. It's none of this, I'm a tough bitch, it's like, you did what? Eyeball. You know? So I respect and, and, and fear female violence. I bow down to it. You know, you better come here. Okay, okay, okay. Don't do your, like, you know, you know premenstrual thing on me, you know? I figured out why women frustrate men so much. It's because men get into, like, this goes here, this goes here, and women just go, oh, I don't know. And they're like, no. No, it, it must be like this. And women are like, no, it's, it's like how I feel today. No, I don't go by feelings. That would get you killed in war. You know, 
I've noticed that when we all grow older and boys turn into men, which is kind of du dubious, they just kind of become fat boys. Um, <laughs> and girls turn into women, the whole relationship changes, you know, because men have a hard time handling their emotions. And as they get older, they become more steady. I'm a steady man. I have a job, I have a car, and payments to make, and responsibilities. And when women start crying for no reason, men just become thoroughly unhinged. Like, you know, the man and woman, they live together, they're having breakfast, and all of a sudden the woman's crying. And the guy's like, what's going on? He thinks it's all about, you know, it's all about him. What have I done? You haven't done anything. Then why are you crying? Sometimes I just have to cry. <laughs> why are you crying? I don't know. And for men, this makes no sense whatsoever. You don't know why you're crying? No! Bullshit! You know why you're crying. Every single thing happens for a reason. You throw a ball up in the air, gravity brings it to the ground. You know why you're crying. You're holding it from me. Out with it. You don't understand me! Bullshit, you don't understand yourself. I am organized. I have all my CDs in alphabetical order. I get to work on time. I know how to fix my car. You are just this emotional creature. That's why you will never be president. That's why we don't let you run the company. That's why you will never drive a spaceship to the moon. Because you know what you're going to do when you get to the moon? You're going to cry. That's what you're going to do. You're going to cry. You're going to freak out. And you're going to paint something some gay ass color. Fuck you. I hate you. Oh, yeah, you hate me. You'll love me in 10 minutes. I'll fuck you. She goes steaming out of there. And the guy goes back to his meal like, fucking women, man. I really went out there, didn't I? <laughs> anyway, the man and the woman are doing their thing, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to see this. I really want to leave. I really want to leave. And they, you know, do a few different positions. They get up and they bow. And I notice people in the crowd, no one's going, yeah. Everyone kind of went, <laughs> oh, wow, why am I here? And then two women come on stage, and uh, one is wearing underwear, and the other one isn't. And the naked one, says, you know, she waves at the crowd, and goes, oh, hello, nude woman. And her, this woman, the other woman who has the panties on, seems to be her assistant. And she holds up two balloons to the crowd, like, see, these are two balloons. And, and everyone goes, okay, gotcha, those are two balloons. And then she holds up a dart. The dart. And was like, oh, okay, a dart, right, okay. And so uh, she hands the dart to the woman. The woman gets on her back and loads. And the woman holding the balloon takes the balloon and kind of throws it gently into the air. And the balloon goes up, up, and it's coming down, down, bang! And the, the tattered remains of the balloon are impaled by the dart in this, on this wooden beam that is conveniently located on stage. And not one of us saw the dart come from this woman. It was not some lazy arc of a dart that went to its target. It was like, I want to put it right there. And it was like, whoa, that was awesome. Because, you know, being a fan of, like, you know, physical fitness and working out and stuff, I, I just wanted to stop the action right there and ask her what she's doing for her abs and her diaphragm and where she got that kind of, con that kind of control, you know? Like, God, what's your diet? What's your workout? You know, what, what, how many reps are you doing? What do you bench, you know? Anyway, sorry. Um, and then another woman comes out uh, with a banana, just a naked woman with a banana. And at this point in the show, we all know what's going to happen. And she gets down and loads and starts kind of like mortaring herself or like, you know, 70 degrees, right? And she's like kind of like aiming at me. And I kind of look over like, no. no, no, no. <laughs> so I do not want to be involved in the crowd participation part. I hate that when someone, I need someone from the audience. You, I'm like, fuck you. I will kill you. Drag me up on stage to be part of your evil plant. You will die, pig fucker. I will kill you. So. I, I'm like putting on the most stern Republican face I can. No, no, I'm sorry. Very uptight. Sphincter closed. Can't do it. No. And so she looks at me and goes, oh, he's no fun. So she, she keeps like, you know, reconfiguring. And she's kind of aiming over here. So I know whatever's going to happen, it's going to happen over here. So I'm like, okay, I'm out of the line of fire. And, and we're all kind of looking over. And this woman is basically aimed at Ken, our, our drum tech. And so all eyes in the whole place are on Ken. And Ken's going like, well, why am I the chosen one, you know? <laughs> and I'll never forget what happened next. I just remember her pelvis kind of dipping down, and then I saw Ken go like... <laughs> and he made this miraculous save, and in his hands is 
the banana. And everyone in the place is like, whoa. You know, impressed more by his save than by her projection. Because it was just the reflexes. I mean, that thing would have hit me right in the head because I'm not, I'm not a fast guy, you know. But Kevin was like, wham, I'm on it. And he just kind of stood, he just sat there, frozen, like stunned. He's like, did I just do that? And I was like, Ken Butler, you are the man. And Ken was like, all of a sudden, the all eyes were on Ken, and he kind of stands up with the banana and goes like. <laughs> and it, yeah, and everyone in the place goes, yeah! Because it was pretty great. And then the woman gets up, and everyone goes, yeah! And she takes the banana from Ken and holds it up. Everyone gives her another round of applause. And then she hands it to Ken, like, would you like a bite? And he's like, no! <laughs> In the 70s, that's when I was a teenager, and uh, I went to a, a boys' school. Uh, it was like a prep school. We all had the, the really lame uniforms, the school patch, the striped tie, white shirt, blue blazer, gray pants, black socks, and the dress shoes. And you know, sit down, shut up. And so <laughs> puberty came, and so did high school dances. So I immediately became interested in going to the high school dance, presumably to meet a female and grope budding breasts, whatever that was going to be like. I really had no idea. And so I went bravely to these high school dances, which were held in the school gymnasium, a building about this size, and they had a 70s cover band to play songs of the day. And so you have the band about here. And if you've ever seen the Fog Hat Live album from the <laughs> mid-70s, these bands looked like that. And the uh, dance floor, the gymnasium, basketball court is bereft of dancers. The boys are all slapped against this wall. The girls are slapped against this wall. And me and all my worthy constituents have our backs against the wall, looking at the opposing team, looking at the girls. And we're all like terrified of them. Every four songs, the guy in the front would go, okay, hey, how about the guys run across the court and ask the girls to dance, yay. And no one would move. Two hours goes by, you're like, okay, I'm gonna do it. No, 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 no. And then you knew you lost your chance when the band goes into Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> that was, and I'm not kidding, it was always the last song played at every high school dance I went to all the way to graduation in 1979. And one night my friend calls me, he goes, hey, you gotta come to a dance with me. I'm like, I can't go to a dance. He goes, why not? I said, uh, I will kill myself if I have to go and have my soul raked across the coals of female indifference and my own terror of the opposite sex. I'm sorry, I'm gonna live in this basement for the rest of my life. He goes, no, you gotta come with me. We're gonna go to this dance. It's gonna be much different. I go, what's gonna happen? We're all gonna get killed? He goes, no, it's a Catholic girls' school. Catholic girls are wild. <laughs> gotta come with me. And you know, I thought to myself, what do I have to lose? My self-worth? I don't have any. You know, <laughs> my will to live, I, I ever had any? I'm like, fuck it, you, you can't take anything more from me, I'll go. And so we go to like Our Lady of the Flaming Immaculate Heart, like one of those, you know, they, they, these schools have these really intense names, like, you know, the, the Crucified Virgin or something. <laughs> something really strenuous and intense, like the, the non-throbbing vulva school of chastity. Like, <laughs> so I go in with my friend and I know the drill. I find my bit of wall. I'm like, okay. <sighs> and the band is playing like the top 40 melange, you know, going from Steve Miller to Aerosmith, just like you think. And you know, an hour goes by, I'm like, oh, I can't stand this, I can't stand this, but these girls are so hot looking. You're like, oh. And I see this girl walking towards me, I'm like, whoa. And she's like looking right at me, and I can't even, I can't even return that, I'm like. <laughs> she comes walking all the way across the gymnasium floor dirty blonde hair, blue eyes, beautiful face, average white band t-shirt, A, W, B, and the W is that chick's ass. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Bell bottom, you know, jeans, dirty sneakers, and an army fatigue jacket with the sleeves as far past her hands. I'm like, whoa, she's decadent, she's filthy. And she's walking towards me, and she walks right up to me, 
puts her hand against the wall over my shoulder. How you doing? <laughs> Gotta keep cool. Fun? <laughs> so you're fine, huh? What's your name? Henry. <laughs> well, Henry, you want to come outside with me? Uh, before I can say, I, okay, she puts her arm around me, swings me around, and starts marching me out the door. My friend sees me, he's like, And I go, yeah, I, yeah, I've scored. And it's, it's my first potential encounter with a female, and I'm the, the submissive one. I'm like being walked out, so like, be, be gentle, you know, don't hurt me. And so we go out there, and we're standing in this courtyard next to the school. Girl pulls out a pack of cigarettes, you know, hits the bottom of the pack, pulls one out. I'm like, whoa. She's got like smoking smarts, you know? She's, uh, she's, you know, going to hell for sure. And so she like, you know, hits the bottom of the pack, one goes whoop, halfway up, she, and I, instead of just kind of going like, thanks, I kind of went, oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I've never smoked before and I am polite. And so I, I, I go like, oh, thank you. And instead of like putting it like really cool, like cool hand Luke in the corner of my mouth, like, yeah, wrong, yeah. I put it right in the, I'm like, <laughs> And like she takes the match, like, and she lights up, and she lights up a match, and she holds it out to me, and I'm like, because I, you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to lean over, kind of immediately light up, and while you inhale, you're supposed to do something really cool with your hand, like, and as you exhale, you're supposed to talk, right? Like, yeah, my math class is a real drag. The teacher's lame. He doesn't understand me, man. And then you're supposed to find the uh, imaginary thing in your teeth and throw it out. You're like, yeah, man, <laughs> fuck it, you know? Yeah, whatever, man. So I, <sighs> what grade are you in, you know? I've been smoking all my life. In the womb, I was smoking. That's how at ease I am with a cigarette. And this girl's like that. And so I, the, the match is starting to burn her fingers. And I'm like, and like my eyesight's not very good, my hand-eye coordination is not all that on, and I've never kind of docked a cigarette to a flame before, so I'm like, <laughs> and she's like, what are you doing? She, her finger's burning. I managed to get the middle third of the cigarette to the flame, <laughs> and, I got, and it's kind of like, I, I, <laughs> like desperately, and I ignited the middle third <laughs> of the smoke. So there's like this canoe-shaped, you know, ember burning. And it looks utterly ridiculous. <laughs> but it's like the Hindenburg is like, thing is like smoking. And she looks at me really weird, like, what's the matter? Don't smoke all the time. And I'm like, oh no, I, I smoke all the time. From her jacket, she pulls out a thing of Jack Daniels, a bottle. And I'm like, oh no. It's like this hell woman, you know? <laughs> and she, you know, uncaps it and goes like, bloop, bloop, bloop. And she hands it to me. I'm like, oh, oh, th th thank you. And I've got a cigarette in one hand, the Jack Daniels in the other. I'm like a poster child for Motley Crue, you know? I'm like, <laughs> and so I'm standing there with this smoke and this Jack Daniels. And I'm like, well, okay. I don't know what, you know, the effect of like bourbon is. So I'm like, well, bottoms up. Go, 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 go. Boom. <laughs> I like defoliated my entire body, you know? You know, napalm. <laughs> blown to the stone age and I'm standing like oh she's looking at me like what's the matter don't drink hard alcohol and chain smoke I'm like oh no I drink and smoke all the time can't you tell she takes the bottle away caps it puts it back in her jacket like let's go inside and dance I'm like okay she takes her cigarette and goes like into the bushes, and I sober up enough to realize that's a damn fire hazard. <laughs> and I won't go that way. So I take my smoke and... <laughs> and we go back into the gymnasium, and the band is playing away. She goes, come on, we're gonna dance. And the you know, band is playing an up-tempo number. I'm like, oh no, what am I gonna do? I'm being dragged out onto this dance floor. I'm like, I'm gonna make a fool out of myself. And the band mercifully comes to the end of the song. I'm like, whew. I start backing up to find my piece of wall. She goes, where are you going? We're gonna dance. I'm like, oh no, well the song is over. I'm, I'm gonna find my, she goes, 
and she holds on. And she goes, "We're gonna dance." Guy goes, "All right, kids, it's the last song of the night." I'm like, "Oh no, here it comes." <laughs> There's a lady. I'm like, "Oh no." Me and this girl go out on the dance floor. I, I grab her, ha, and I put my chin into her shoulder. Like, okay, here we go. And she's moving her head around. I'm like, what are you doing? You're supposed to have your chin digging into my shoulder. My chin is digging into your shoulder. We're going to grit our teeth, have a horrible time, and get through this somehow. I'm like, ah, ah. And she's moving her head. I'm like, what is she doing? I'll put my chin even deeper into her shoulder. Ah, ah, ah. And she's moving her head around. Like, ah. And she, whew, she gets her head around mine. All of a sudden, I'm staring right at, at her. I'm like, what, what, what? She opens her mouth, and like the alien, her tongue comes out. <laughs> And I was about to go like, what are you? <laughs> and you remember the first time that happened to you. And the first like two seconds was like, whoa, I've never felt anything like that before in my life. Even if it was your uncle when you were four. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not trying to dig too deep and then bring up anything that, you know, we don't want to get into during this during this evening's encounter. But anyway, you know, you remember the first couple of seconds, like, whoa, whoa, that's different. But immediately you become like expert man or woman in kissing, you become tongue master. And that was my experience. I was like, whoa, 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 aha. <laughs> first I will withhold the tongue, yeah, and tease you. And now the plague of time. <laughs> like five minutes later, I am like lamped onto this young girl like a placosmus catfish. <laughs> and if we wander down the <laughs> I have this woman in a death grip, like six more minutes goes by, and she I don't need to breathe my own air. I am breathing the air out of her lungs. And she by her being her stare her way to head. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Good night. We'll be playing next week. <laughs> With all of her human strength left in her body, she puts her hands on my shoulders like one, two, three, and the lock is broken. <laughs> she goes, Get away! I'm like, but I love you. Get away from me. Get away. And I, I went home. I walked like two and a half miles all the way home, like just putting my tongue on everything. Like, wow, there's a tree. Not bad. My, my arm. Wow, that was wild. And I went home and I played. I got home really late that night, like 9.20 in the evening. You know, who oh, crazy Friday night for the big guy. And uh, I, I pull out my records. You know, I put on like Ted Nugent. And all of a sudden, his words became gospel to me. Because now I understood. Ah, now I see, I see. And the first Van Halen album, David Lee Roth went from like singer to God to me. You know, like running with the devil on me. Like, yes, I too. I'm running down that same road with you, David Lee. I am with you. I too am running with this devil that you speak of. And from then on, I just became a maniac. And I go to these dances like, come on, who wants to kiss me? Come on, fucker. You think I can't? Come on, don't make me beg. And that's, that's my impression of two LA policemen having uh, sex in the McDonald's drive-through before they have to order. Like, come on, fucker, come on, come on. <coughs> Big Mac, please. <laughs> Sorry. Nah, nah, nah. Come on, look at my tongue. I can do all kinds of things with it. Come on, you want to you? You want to be you? You, come on, girl. Nah, nah. People are like getting on chairs to get away from me, you know. So I have uh, Catholicism to thank for that. <laughs> See you next time. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot. Thanks. <laughs> Ah, ah, ah.
Yeah! <laughs>